Video number five thousand from the Mathnasium coming to you. Here we have the Unit Five review of probability, ladies and gentlemen. Let's dive right into this. Here we go. Great, that was very anticlimactic. Next slide. Perfect. Here we go. All right. Interpret the probability as a long run relative frequency. So one thing you got to remember is that you kind of have two different kinds of <clears throat> ways to determine the probability of something. Um, probability is a, like a long run relative frequency. That's what it is. But there is two different things. There's experimental probability and there's theoretical probability ways to determine um, probability. And uh, really, the difference is in how you approach the problem. Experimental probability, like say we're trying to find the probability of heads, okay? We want to find the probability of getting heads in one flip with a flip of a coin. Well, um, assuming, you know, we have lots of time, experimental probability you would find the probability of heads um, by flipping a coin many, not just one many, many, many times. Okay, this is experimental probability is you take the coin and you flip and 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 flip, and flip um, very, very a large amount of times. Now, if you looked at the probability as we continued to flip, you'll see we're like, oh man, we have a good, this coin is not balanced. Look at look at all the heads we're getting, right? But then we got a long streak of tails and that evened it back down. Um, and, and so you can see it kind of fluctuate. It goes below the line, above the line, above the line, below the line, above the line. It's fluctuating back and forth. And it's kind of asymptotically approaching in a sense, the true, uh, probability of the event, which seems to be about 0.5, okay? And this is called the law of large numbers. Okay, the law of large numbers says that um, if we sample many, many times, I'll just say many times, I know I broke the cardinal rule, if we sample many times, the sample probability, I should say the cumulative sample probability, Yeah, the cumulative uh, sample pro probability of an outcome approaches the actual probability of that outcome. And the more that we sample, I think the more accurate of a representation we're going to get. Now, as you can see, this is drifting fair, you know, fairly far, but we've done 600 samples so far. Um, in this particular example. So that's experimental probability. If you want to determine the probability of heads theoretically, well, that's actually much simpler, or it can be. Sometimes experimental is simpler. But what you do is you look at the sample space. The sample space is all possible outco outcomes for one flip of a coin. Well, when you flip a coin, you have two possible outcomes. You can either have heads or you can have tails. Um, so the theoretical probability is the number of outcomes um, in an event that favor an event running out of room divided by the total number. This is a very um, of outcomes. Okay, and this is very simple in this case. There are two possible outcomes for the flip of a coin, and only one of them favors heads. Now, this is a simple example, but it could be like, <clears throat> you know, we're going to see some other ones that are a little bit different. So what does it mean 
when someone says there's a 0.72 probability that Mr. Slagle's wife will laugh, as it, laugh at his jokes. That means that um, if Slagle tells... Now, one thing you got to know is if I flip heads over and over and over and over and over again, right, and I give this heads, does that mean that, that we are more likely to get tails on the next flip? No, because each flip is independent of the one previously. Like what you got on the first flip doesn't, first flip doesn't determine what you have on the next flip. Okay, so if they're independent, um, then basically, um, no, you're not more likely to get tails. You could keep getting heads; it's still fifty percent. But you're bound at some point. You know, you're probably going to get tails, and you'll probably hit a long streak of tails just from random variability. So if Slagle tells <coughs> many, many jokes. over a long period of time about 72% of them will cause his wife to laugh now I'll tell you this here's, the, here's just a you know, pretty solid message. Uh, guys, if if you haven't done your household responsibilities, 0% of your jokes will make your wife laugh. That's just a little advice for you, okay? Not saying I've avoided any responsibilities, uh, just saying that, you know, I've observed other relationships that have been in that situation. So just saying, okay. Number two, <clears throat> use simulation to model chance behavior. Hmm. Mm. Okay. Well, this kind of this kind of boils down to our hypothesis test in a lot of ways, and we used simulation on the very first day of class. We learned about a woman named Joy Milne in the UK who claimed that she could smell Parkinson's, and we can use probability uh, to kind of talk about the way that joy is doing this. So remember how this worked is um, the researchers gave joy 12 t-shirts um, and basically joy uh, decides whether each shirt has um, was was owned by someone that had Parkinson's disease. Um, <clears throat> so basically, the assumption would be going into this experiment is that we're trying to, you know, we're trying to see if she can smell. So the assumption is that she can't. So the way that we start is we'll say, you know, assuming Joy is guessing randomly. I'm going to do this a little different, um, different than we did in class. In class, we did cards. Um, but assuming we're going to do this without cards this time, assuming Joy is guessing randomly um, if someone has Parkinson's. And we're going to assume that they didn't uh, sh they didn't tell her um, how many of the shirts were Parkinson's patients, right? Um, so assuming... Uh, Someone has Parkinson's uh, disease or not. Um, yeah, Joey's guessing randomly if someone has Parkinson's <coughs> disease or not. There's a 50% chance she would guess. correctly for each shirt. Cool. All right, so um, what we're going to do is we will, to simulate this, we will randomly, we will generate 12 random binary numbers so we're assuming Joy is guessing randomly. 
We're going to generate 12 random binary numbers. And we'll let 0 represent an incorrect guess. And 1 represent a correct guess. Yeah, perfect. This should work. Um, even if the researchers here, um, you know, even if the researchers were to put in all Parkinson's patients or all non-Parkinson's patients, you would expect uh, to get the expected number of ones and zeros is is six, right? So you would you would still get hopefully roughly, you know, half of them right. So she's expected just by randomly guessing since there's two options to probably get about half of them correct. Okay, number two. What we're going to do is we're going to generate 12 simulated guesses and um, record the number of correct out of 12. Pretty cool, huh? So yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna generate twelve simulated guesses, basically twelve zeros or ones, and we're gonna count the number of ones because those are correct guesses, and we're gonna record that information. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna repeat this process. Since it's done with the computer, should be able to repeat it, repeat it thousands and thousands of times. Repeat this process many times. Okay, and this would be a great simulation, but now what we can do at the end, what we can do at the end of this is we can, um, now this is kind of more like a simulated, you know, hypothesis test here, but we can compare the results of Joy's sample, because Joy's only doing this once. We can compare the results of Joy's sample to our distribution of simulated guesses. Okay, um, to see how many or rather to see what percent were as rare or rarer or more rare than Joy's sample. Cool. Yeah, awesome. This is a great way to simulate and check. I know that's a lot of writing. Uh, and check to see what Joy's got going on uh, with her. So I believe in the in the study she guessed 11 out of 12 correct, um, which is a very rare occurrence if you're just guessing um, guessing randomly. So you can look and see. And a random number generator is a lot a one great way to do it. Uh, you could also <clears throat> do it with cards or so on and so forth. Okay, here we go. Give a probability model for a chance process with equally likely outcomes and use it to find the probability of an event. All right, well, we're going to talk about rock, paper, scissors here. Um, and basically, the probability model, we're going to have to create a probability model. It is just a way to convey um, a way to convey when two people are playing the game on paper. So I would use uh, an ordered pair. So I would say, let's let each ordered pair or tuple represent one game 
of rock, paper, scissors between two people. R comma P means player one through rock and player two through paper. If you want to be really specific here, you would uh, list each of these events, um, you know, out, but rock is that player, th corresponding player through rock, so on and so forth. What is the complete, um, you know, what is the complete sample space look like for one game? If you're playing one game of rock, paper, scissors, the complete sample space looks like all the scenarios in which you um, tie. So that would be like you throw a rock, your opponent throws a rock, you throw scissors, your opponent throws scissors, you throw paper, your opponent throws paper. Okay, well that's the, yeah, there's three outcomes there. Um, there's all the scenarios in which you win, which would mean you throw rock, you throw scissors, you throw paper. And in um, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and paper beats, uh, I guess these are all the ones where player one is winning, and paper beats rock. Okay, so those are your next three scenarios in our sample space. And then the third three scenarios are when you lose. There are three ways to lose. That would be you throw, assuming you're player one, you throw scissors, your opponent throws rock, it's just all these reversed. You throw paper, your opponent throws scissors, you throw rock, your opponent throws paper. And that is all possible outcomes. Remember, you can find that, basically, it's the number of, um, um, orderings of three of two length two from three things. That's I think three permute two is what this is. It's not combinations because then these two would be so order matters here, right? So what's the probability you don't win? Again, we're looking at the sample space. The total number of things in the sample space is nine. Um, how many of them involve us not winning? Well. Let's take a look here. Not winning, well, these are all the ones where I win. So not winning is your tying. So one, two, three. I didn't win there, and I lost all these. All those were losses, all those were ties. So it's six out of nine, which is 0 0.66 repeating. So roughly a 66%, 0.6% chance of um, not winning on any given game. Super. Number four, use basic probability rules, including the complement rule and the addition rule for mutually exclusive events. Okay, mutually exclusive means that they are two events that cannot happen at the same time. So let's say we're looking at this probability distribution for what uh, NPHS seniors are doing after high school. This is made up data. Let's say 34% are going to college, 23% are going to trade school, 9% are going directly to work full time, and the question mark is all other categories. So first things first, what is the probability of other? Well, we know for a probability distribution that if these are all of our options, they have, have to represent the whole of the NPHS senior class, because um, other is all encompassing. And you know that all of the probabilities in a probability distribution should add up to one. So what we can do is we can do one minus 0.34 plus 0 0.23 plus 0 0.09, which is going to give us um, 1 minus, that's going to be, let's see here, 0.34, uh, that'll be 0 0.32, 0 0.66, 0 0.66, and 1 minus 0 0.66 is um, 0 0.33. Three, four. Look at that. Okay, so the probability of other is 0 0.34 because we know the probability of everything has to be one in total. So now let's find the probability that you're not going to college 
or trade school. Okay, well, the probability that a random selected, randomly selected NPH senior is not going to college and not going to trade school is going to be equal to, basically, the probability that you select what's left, that they are either working or they're doing something else or other. And the probability for working or other, this is, um, so we did the complement rule here. Right? We know that everything has to add to one, so you can subtract one to get what's remaining. Um, and the addition rule for mutually excuse, exclusive events is if you want to know um, basically working or other, these are mutually exclusive. So we can just add their probabilities. The probability of working or other is equal to the probability of working plus the probability of other, which is equal to, so we'll call this W O C M T, different events, um, which is equal to 0 0.09 plus 0 0.34, which is a total of 0 0.43. Cool. There's a 43% chance that a randomly selected NPH S high school senior is not going to college and not going or not going to trade school. nor trade school, I should say. Okay, uh, what about the probability you go to college if you know um, um, Oh, the other way I, I would say to write this, uh, the or word uh, can be represented by uh, an upside down U. So you can say that's the prob or uh, a regular U, sorry. Um, working intersect other, or sorry, uh, working or other as an option. This is this is the same way to write that shorthand. Probability of going to college if you know they aren't working. So if you randomly select someone, you know that they're not working, what's the probability that they're going to college? Okay, what we're looking at here is the probability of uh, going to college given, okay, they have this little given symbol, that they are not working, which is um, working complement, which is basically everything else but working. So basically what that does is it eliminates the working option from our sampling distribution. So the total is here in this case, um, if we're moving down the line here, really what we're, what we're considering is the total number of outcomes. So the outcome, the probability, this is going to be the probability uh, that they're going to college um, and they're not working over the probability. Um, this is the, I guess this is a, a different rule entirely, but that's okay. This is the conditional probability rule. Um, so what we'll just say is we'll look at for college, the probability that they go to college from a randomly selected is 34%, 34% of the population. But if we know that they're not working, we can eliminate that from the total. So if they're not working, it's just 0 0.34 for college uh, plus 0 0.23 for the trade school plus 0 0.34 for the other category. So if we know they're not working, not going to trade school, and they're not going to college. Um, and then we can uh, solve this uh, or we can evaluate this um, just on our calculators really quick and you're going to get a little bit, basically this is just a little bit less than one, so when you divide you end up getting something a little bit bigger than 0.34, which is 0.37 about. Okay, so again I just took basically the working out of the denominator there. Alright, let's do another one here. This one says use a two-way table or a Venn diagram to model a chance process and calculate probabilities involving two events. Um, so a study examines three diets, diets A, B, and C, used by 256 people of similar height and weight. After three months of dieting, subjects record whether or not they lost more than five pounds. Okay, first thing is um, you got to know about a two-way table is what you're going to be given, likely, what you'll be given for a two-way table is just these middle sections. You'll probably just be given this, um, and it'll probably be filled out. Um, I'm giving you something else, so you, I'm giving you like bits and pieces of the table so that you have to figure them out kind of on your own and we can kind of do this together. So try and pause the video and try and figure this out by yourself. 
uh, if you know that there's 256 people in the study, um, and you, you, should, you can kind of reverse engineer what you got going on here. Uh, so I'm going to start by looking at, for filling out the table, diet C, uh, 29 plus 42 is going to give us 71 people there um, uh, in diet C for the total. And we know that the total that lost 5 pounds is 38 uh, that's 88 plus 29, 88 plus uh, 30 is 118 minus 1 is 117. Yeah. So 117 there. And then what we can do is we can now, if we know that this is 117 and this is 71, we can figure out how many people didn't lose 5 pounds because we know that the totals here have to add up to 256 in this column and in this row, and that these columns and rows add up to the, add up to the total here. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what these two are, and we're going to do that. Um, just do 256 minus 117, which is 139, and I'm going to do 256 minus 98 minus 71 to give us 87 here. Wow, look at that. Success rate of diet B is looking a lot better. Okay, so then what do I do to find, for example, um, what do I find um, the people that didn't lose five for these other diets? Let's take a look at that. Um, well, we can just do 87 minus 50, which is going to be 37. Didn't lose five pounds for this diet. And 30, 98 minus 38 leaves uh, 60 that didn't lose five pounds for diet A. Now when we add across the bottom, you're going to double check that those add up to 256. 98. You also want to check that these add up to 139. So 60 plus 37 plus 42. Yep, so we're good. We're all in good shape. All the columns and rows add up. That's a good way to start. Um, you may see, one thing you need to know is you may see that um, in a two-way table that it's not represented with frequency because right now we're looking at frequency it could be relative frequency to create a relative frequency um, two-way table all you do is take all the numbers in the table and divide by 256 and that'll give you um, basically these will all add up to something and these will all add up to one these will all add up to one it's a real easy way to, to do that and to talk about probabilities here. Um, great. Now let's look at the actual probabilities in using a two-way uh, table. Um, and it's saying probabilities involving two events. Let's start with one event. What's the probability that a randomly selected individual from this study lost five pounds? Well, I know that out of all 256 people that are in this uh, group, 117 of them lost 5 pounds. So we do 117 uh, divided by 256 uh, to get our result there, which is here 0 0.457 roughly. Okay. So um, roughly about 40, close to 46% of the people met their goal of losing 5 pounds. Um, now, this is a different question. What's the probability that they lost five pounds um, if we randomly are selecting someone from uh, diet A? Basically, if we know they're from diet A, then what's the pr probability that they lost five pounds? Well, that's going to change um, because in diet A, the total number that we're looking at now, so it's conditional on being in diet A, the total number is, in this case, well, first of all, let's go over the conditional rule. Um, for conditional probability, the rule is it is um, the probability of L intersect A divided by the probability of A. Okay. Now, I could put for these, if we're, I could actually do the probabilities of these intersections. Um, and let's come down here really fa fast and do A intersect L. So A and L is can be written as A intersect L. It's that little cap. Okay, and A intersect L is just basically, um, it's going to be out of 256. Um, how many people were both 
uh, in diet A and lost five pounds, that's only 38. So that's actually kind of easier to start with. Um, so what we do is we know that L intersect A and intersect L are the same things. So we can just type, uh, uh, you, we could do, for example, we could do this as 38 over 256. Um, and this thing is going to also be over 256. All of them are. So you can actually just skip the 256s and just worry about the counts. You'll end up getting the same result here. The probability of L intersect A, I'll just put 38 here. And P, the probability of A is, well, let's think about that. How many people, um, let's just look at the number of people. We're in diet A. That is 98, which will give us 0 0.388. Okay, so you can look. You're not actually using the probabilities here, you're using the counts, but um, it turns out to be exactly the same. Um, because you'll end up with 30, 38 over 256 divided by 98 over 256. And the 256 is just canceled out in the process. So Now, how about the probability of A intersect L? Uh, or sorry, A. So this is the probability that your randomly selected person is from diet A, given that we know that they've lost 5 pounds. Okay, well, this is slightly different. This is the probability of L intersect A divided by the probability of L. Well, the probability of L, or the count for L, this is still 38. The count for L is, um, lost five pounds is 117. So this is actually even less than the one previously. This is roughly 0.325. Okay, so that's how I use a two-way table to calculate conditional probabilities and also um, intersections or unions. Intersections or unions just correspond basically to these individual boxes. For example, this is L intersect A, this is L intersect B, L intersect C, this would be D intersect A, D intersect B, D intersect C for the counts. Um, but then you have to divide them by 256. Okay, the next one is apply the general addition rule to calculate probabilities. So for this one, it helps to think about the Venn diagram before we do our calculation. So let's say um, here's our kind of our sample space. And we've got a bunch of things that are going on, but let's say we're only zoomed in on event A and event, whoops, and event L. Now, we know, for example, in, from this diagram that there were 38 people in the intersection. Um, and, uh, and so this, is, this right here is event A. We'll call this event L. And we know that there are 38 individu individuals. This thing right here is A intersect L. Um, and then out here um, is this is um, a complement intersect L complement. Okay, so the probability that you are in A or you're in L, um, the general addition rule says this is going to be equal to the probability of A, and this works in all cases, even when they're mutually exclusive, except the intersection is zero, but whatever. Okay, the probability of A minus, sorry, plus the probability of L. Okay, so, but if I do that, so let's take a look at that really fast. Um, the probability of A is gonna be this red shaded region. Okay, and the probability of L is going to be this green shaded region. Now the problem is, this is how we remember the general addition rule for OR events, right? So actually, let me, let me back this up for just one second. And I'm going to say that the word OR, remember, is represented by that, that cap. Or sorry, by the U. A union L is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of L. And then the problem is, here's A, here's L, 
they overlap. So this spot was counted twice in our probability. If this spot is counted twice, that means we have to subtract off the, the intersection. So we have to subtract off um, A intersect L. That's where they overlap. So the union is equal to the probability A plus the probability of L minus their intersection. Okay, so what is this? Well, this is going to be equal to the probability of A. We calculated that from the last slide. Probability of A, well, I guess it's 98 over 256. So 98 over 256 for A, 98 over 256 plus um, this one is 117 over 256 minus the intersection, which is 38 over 256. So you end up getting um, 177 over 256, which is 0.691. Another way to do that is What's the probability that a randomly selected person is from diet A or lost? So that when you see that on the table, it's like, because when that, what they're doing is you're adding the 98, you're adding the 17, but these 38 get double counted, so you have to subtract them off once. Another easy way to get um, 177 over 256 is just add up all the boxes that satisfy that, and then you won't double count. So you could do 60 plus 38 plus 50 plus 29. That's lost 5 and um, part of diet A. And 60 plus 38 plus 50 plus 29 uh, had better add up to 177. And then you just do 177 divided by 256 and you'll be good to go. Okay, that's the general addition rule. Conditional probabilities, we already did that um, on the first slide, so we're good. Um, now let's talk about uh, independence and mutual exclusivity. So determine, this is Eight, determine if two events are independent. Well, when you talk about independence, you first need to talk about kind of what does it mean for things to be mutually exclusive um, so you don't get those two things confused. So what mutually exclusive means um, is it means, so for this case, um, for all of these examples, it'll be 10, 40, 20, and 30 for the totals. And what we're doing here is we're going to complete the table so that the events male and blue eyes are mutually exclusive. What that means is there are no individuals um, in which they are both male and have blue eyes. So there's only one table that can be filled out where those two events are, um, so where those two events don't share anyone, right? So um, basically, mutually, mutually exclusive are events that can't occur at the same time. So if it's impossible for us to randomly select someone and have them be both male and have blue eyes, then that means that this number has to be zero. If this number is zero, then that means there are 10 females. If there are 10 females with blue eyes, then there are 20 females with brown eyes because they have to add up to 30. And that means that there are 20 males with um, brown eyes. Super. That's what mutual exclusive means. Determine two events of independence. So what does independent mean? Independent means something different. Let's change to green. Come on, computer. You can do this. Okay, independent means something different. Uh, it means that um, it means that knowing basically, if you know someone is male, that doesn't change the the pro so we know. So for example, we know that. Um, 10 out of 50 have blue eyes, and we know that 20 out of 50 are male. 
from the study. So what independence means is if we know that 10 people in the study have blue eyes, if we know that they're male, it doesn't change the probability. So knowing that they're male doesn't change the probability that um, of selecting someone with blue eyes, basically. So that would mean, um, you know, basically changing genders is going to, or looking at each gender, there isn't a different probability of females with blue eyes than there are with males. So if they have the same probability, then the total probability is going to be that same probability as well. So how do we say that in words? Oops. We say, there are really two ways to say it. You can say, knowing the student is male does not change the probability of blue eyes. It also can be said that knowing that a student, assuming these are students, knowing a student has blue eyes does not change the probability that the randomly selected suit is male. All right, so let's think about this. We need to make it so um, and, and rather, let's put this in equation format. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, so equation format, I'm going to call this just, I'll call this L for blue and R for brown um, because they both start with B, if you guys are okay with that. So what this would be, knowing that a student is male does not change the probability of blue. So the probability of blue, um, the probability of blue given that they're male is basically has to be equal to the probability that they're blue given that they're not male. And I didn't say female here because we might have a two-way or a, a two-way table that has three columns in it, right? So you would have to check both of those things, um, which also has to be equal to just the probability that they have blue eyes altogether. Okay, and then over here, this would be um, knowing a student has blue eyes does not change their uh, change the probability of male. Okay, so the probability of male, given that they have blue eyes, has to be equal to the probability of male, given they don't have blue eyes, um, which has to be equal to the overall probability of male. So. You know that two events are independent. You don't have to check both of these. You just have to check one. If you know that, um, yeah, if you know one of these and true, then you, then you know those two events are independent. So we're not checking for independence here. We're constructing the table. So this is how you check. You look at the two-way table and you check um, to see if these things are evil, equal and you only really need to check um, one set of them because the other one falls in line. Uh, because of that, but we need the probability of blue for male and female to be the same as the, the total probability overall. That means basically two-tenths of the females need to be uh, have blue eyes, which is going to be six, which means that's 24. Okay, again, um, this was 10 out of, probability of blue is 10 out of 50. Um, so I just did um, that's 20%, so I did 0.2 um, times 30, which is 6. And then 20% of 20 is just 4, which means there are 16 people with brown. Now you'll notice, I, I was looking at these two, right? Um, well, here it's 20 out of 50 of the males. Um, there are the basically, th that's, if we look at this row here, that would be knowing, you know, 
looking from the perspective of looking to see whether or not somebody is male. And 20 out of 30, which is, what is that, 40%. So in this case, 40% of the total um, is male. Um, so if you look at blue eyes, given that they're blue eyes, uh, they have blue eyes, 40% are male. Given that they don't have blue eyes, uh, what's 40% of 40? That's going to be 16. So it's still the same. Basically what it's saying is all of these columns um, are the same ratio. And when you look here, you get the same ratio. That's how you know that they're independent. Determine if two events are independent. Well, we already did that. Um, well, now what it's saying is complete the table so that the ma events male and blue eyes are not mutually exclusive and not independent. If they're not mutually exclusive, that means um, there is an overlap. Okay, so we know that they have to overlap here. Um, and we know that they can't have the same ratio. So there's only one solution for this two-way table for independence, and there's only one solution for this table with mutually exclusive. But if they're not mutually exclusive, any number could go here as long as um, it's not four, I think. So if, let's say we put the number seven here. We know that this is 10 and this is 40. We know that this is 20 and this is 30. Okay, if there are seven males with blue eyes, that means there have to be three males, or three females with blue eyes. Uh, that would mean if there are three females with blue eyes, that there are 27 females with brown eyes. And if there are seven males with blue eyes, there are 13 males with brown eyes. So this is not mutually exclusive because there are people that are both uh, male and blue eyes are not mutually exclusive because there are males that have blue eyes. And we know that they're not independent because there are different probabilities um, when you change genders here. If you're looking at the female um, column, you have a different probability than the total probability, which means that they're not independent. Okay, use the general multiplication rule to calculate probabilities. The general multiplication rule. It would be uh, helpful. I would recommend um, you, and I'll, I'll put these on the, the cheat sheet, but it'd be nice you know, to have all these rules kind of handy. And they might actually be on the equation sheet already. Um, let's just go ahead and take a look really fast. It won't take too long. Yeah, they, um, these are the ones that you've got for your equation sheet that you're given. You have the conditional probability right here for your test, um, but you can write anything down, right? It's open book, open note, and you have the general addition rule here, and you have the conditional rule. It doesn't look like they give you the general um, multiplication rule, but that's okay. Um, it's something that you guys probably can just do instinctively anyways. But what the general multiple, let's read the problem first. It says, suppose that 10% of adults belong to health clubs and 40% of these health club members work out at least twice per week. Find the probability that a randomly selected adult belongs to a health club and works out twice per week. So if you're really writing this down, you would say the thing that we haven't been doing before is spell these out. Um, let H uh, represent the event um, where a randomly selected adult belongs to a health club and let T be the event blah 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 where a randomly selected adult works out at least twice per week. Okay, what the general multiplication rule is, is so, so what you have here in this case is you know that 10% of the population, basically 
10% uh, of the population belongs to a health club. So let's say that population is 100 people, then you know that uh, 10 of those people belong to health clubs, right? Um, and then 40% of the people that are in the health club um, work out at least twice per week. Well, 40% of 10 is just four. So what you're, you're, the general multiplication rule is saying like, you're just going down like subsets of the population and you can multiply those percentages to figure out uh, what the total is. So basically, if you know that 10% of the total population health club and 40% of that population, well, we can just do 10 times 40 to get uh, 4%. That's basically what it says. And so the way it's written is the probability of H intersect T is equal to um, the probability of H times the probability of T given H. So this right here is the probability of H. This right here is the probability of um, it's not the overall probability for people that work out um, twice a week. It's the probability that for workout twice a week, given that you know um, they belong to health clubs. So what we can do here is we can plug in these numbers and do 0.1 times 0 0.4 to get 0 0.04, and 4% of 100 is four people. So there's our answer, the probability of, of both of those happening. But a, a better way to look at these scenarios is through something called a tree diagram. So basically, you take your population, you're dividing up into two branches. There's the branch uh, that belongs to a health club, and then there's the branch that doesn't belong to a health club. And we know that 10% of the people belong to a health club, which means 90% of the people do not belong to a health club. Now, if you take that tree diagram and you split it up further for the second decision, um, you're now looking at the people that work out twice a week and the people that don't. So if you look at the people that work out twice a week from the health clubs, at least twice a week, that's 40%, which means the people that don't work out twice a week is 60%. Okay. Uh, and then down here, I didn't give you these numbers, but we're just going to make them up for the sake of this problem. Um, let's say, uh, let's say if you um, if you don't belong to health club, the people that work out at least twice a week is maybe 30%, um, and that would mean 70% don't. It's kind of a, abysmal there, but that's okay. So what we did, um, this is given H, right? So these are not the same probability or the same events because this isn't T. Um, this is T given H. This is T complement given that we've already selected H. And this is T given that we've selected H complement. And this is T that we've selected T complement selected with H, H complement. So this is the scenario in which they don't go twice a week, um, but they have a health membership with 60%. This is they go, they were, sorry, they work out twice a week but they don't have a membership at least twice a week. And this is they don't work out twice a week given that they don't have a membership. So let's go through and find each of these. So the one that we just found was 0 0.04. You can multiply along. Um, so this would be multiplying along the column. This is going to be H intersect, or rather, I will say, yeah, H intersect T. This is H intersect t complement this is h complement intersect t and this is h complement intersect t complement and so we can figure out what those probabilities are by multiplying this is 0 0.04 this is 0 0.06 and then coming down here 0 0.9 times 0.3 is 0 0.27 and this one is 0 0.9 times 0 0.7 which is 0 0.63. Now when we're done if we add all of these up you should get um, one hopefully uh, this will be 
in this case, yeah, these add up to 90, and these are going to add up to, or 0 0.9, these will add up to 10, which adds up to 1, so we can get shape. All right, so now what if I said, I want you to find the probability that a randomly selected person works out twice a week. Now this is from the entire population. What's the random the probability that a randomly selected person works out twice a week? Well, it's not 0.4 because that's only the people that worked out at the gym. So what you have to do is you have to um, you have to take and add these two together. So what this is going to be here is it's going to be um, Basically what we've done with these is we've created our two-way table. So I could plop this into a two-way table and, and, and be in good shape. And a two-way table I think is a little more informative, but that's okay. Yeah, so what we're gonna do, the probability that a randomly selected person is, um, works out twice a week is gonna be this probability, 0 0.04 plus the probability down here, which is 0 0.27. So you're going to end up with 0 0.31. So the 31% chance that a randomly selected individual from this population uh, works out at least twice a week. Yep, cool. Mm, okay, when appropriate, use the multiplication rule for independent events to calculate probabilities. This one's a little weird. The wording is strange, but it's interesting to talk about nonetheless. If 28% of households in Fairbanks have no pets, what's the probability that if you randomly select seven households in Fairbanks, at least one will have no pets? Okay, whenever you see at least one, you need to think about the complement rule. So independent events is, it's basically saying, um, you know, if an event is independent and you know the probability of an event, then you can just multiply to find the probability of that happening. For instance, what's the probability that I get four heads in a row? Well, flipping a coin, uh, for those flips are independent, right? Flipping a coin once is not going to determine what I flip the next time. Um, an example of not independent would be like sampling uh, without replacement. So like if you have, if you're trying to find the you know, pull names out of a hat and you're not putting the names back in, well, once someone has been pulled out, you can never draw them again, right? So the, the probability has changed after the first event has happened. But with flipping a coin, that doesn't happen. So what's the probability of flipping four heads in a row? row? Well, that's 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0.5. The multiplication rule for independent events um, is, you, you know, basically you're, you're just multiplying the same thing over and over again. So what we're doing here is we're trying to find the probability that um, at least one house out of seven has no pets. Okay, well the probability that at least one house out of no pets is equal to uh, one minus the complement of that. Um, so you have two ways that you can go about this. Um, the probability of at least, for at least one house having no pets, um, you have to consider the situation um, where one house has no pets, two houses have no pets, whatever, 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 and that can get kind of tricky. So rather than do that, you just do the complement, and you'd say, um, this is the probability of 1 minus the probability that all houses um, have pets. Okay, and the probability that all houses have pets is 1 minus um basically what's the probability that one house has pets well that's going to be one minus 0.28 which is 0.72 so if if you the probability that you get all 
you sample all houses that have pets is the probability you get one is 0.72. So if you're doing this seven times, it's going to be 0 0.72 to the seventh power. Uh, so we do one minus, and when you raise that, um, you end up getting. Let's take a look. One minus zero point one zero zero three zero six, which is zero point nine zero approximately. So there is a ninety percent chance that at least one house out of seven has no pets. If you if you were to randomly select seven houses, um, ninety percent of the time when you randomly select seven, there's going to be at least one that has no pets. Pretty crazy when there's only 20% chance of that happening. So sometimes it, it, it's easier to think about the complement of uh, the situation for that probability problem. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have for you for this video. Thanks for watching. Uh, it's been a real wild ride, and uh, we'll get the next one coming out to you soon. Have a good day.